Zipper rolls out to the right, pitches off to Taylor, and Taylor's to the 20. Down to the 15, down to 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Billy Taylor scored a touchdown from 21 yards out. The crowd goes berserk. It was November 22nd, 1969 that they came to Barry, Michigan, all dressed in maize and blue. The words were said, the prayers were read, and everybody cried. But when they closed the coffin, there was someone else inside. Oh, they came to Barry, Michigan, but Michigan wasn't dead. And when the game was over, it was someone else instead. Eleven Michigan Wolverines put on the gloves of gray, and as the organ played the victors, they laid Woody Hayes away. Under center is Wangler at the 45. He goes back. He's looking for a receiver. He throws downfield to fire. Welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue and welcome to our Michigan Game Day show for Maryland Week. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Joining us today with his thoughts on everything going on around Michigan football is beat writer Austin Meek from The Athletic. First, my view from Section 17 and more thoughts from Maryland head coach Mike Loxley. On Friday, we may or may not find out if Jim Harbaugh will be on the sidelines for Saturday's game. There are so many stories swirling around right now. Chris Ballas from The Wolverine on 3 reported this morning that he's hearing several things. Michigan and the Big Ten might be in negotiations to avoid court on Friday and compromise. He said that could mean Jim would sit out Maryland and be back for Ohio State. That has to be something Jim would agree to. The other thing we're hearing is that the Big Ten might ask for a change of venue to federal court, thus pushing back the date for an injunction. So who really knows what's going on behind the scenes? We'll know for sure in the next 48 hours, at least we think we will. With all of that going on, Michigan is putting the finishing touches on their game plan for Maryland. The Terps have the best passing game we've seen all year, and rest assured they will come out firing against us. A few weeks ago, Talia Tagalavoy lit up Penn State for 186 yards in the first half alone. Now, I cannot imagine them having that kind of success against us if they are one-dimensional. Bottom line, this isn't a trap game, but it is the week before the game, so we will need to come out focused and take it to these guys right out of the gate. It will be another Saturday of shutting out the noise and taking care of business. At his presser this week, Coach Mike Loxley shared his thoughts on Saturday's challenge for the Terps. You know, moving on to Michigan, obviously this is a tremendous opportunity for our program. You know, a top five team coming in here, uh, a, a t- the reigning champion of the Big Ten, um, extremely talented team. You know, had the last two days having the opportunity to watch, you know, all three phases. And, you know, these they're one of those teams that it isn't one player that kind of the marquee guy. They've got a bunch of really good players that seem to play well together. And, and that's what jumps out on the tape. I got a lot of respect for them. Obviously, they're going through some of their own issues. Uh, and for 18 to 22 year olds to be able to kind of compartmentalize and stay focused on the task at hand, which uh, they were able to do last week up in uh, State College, which is a tough place to play and win, you know, shows uh, the type of team that they've, they've uh, developed over there. He had plenty of good things to say about the Michigan defense, too. Chris Jenkins Jr. is a, a, a star in the making. He's one of the, those guys in our league that when you put the tape on, he flashes. Uh, they've got a good corner, you know, the Johnson kid, really tall, talented players, two talented linebackers. But you look across the board, and, and this team plays really well together. Like, it's not one shining star that kind of sets them apart. I mean, they are a – a well-oiled machine, especially on the defensive side of the ball. They they play really sound. 
they don't make a lot of mistakes, meaning I mean, you, you are going to have to execute at a really high level. And for me, that's kind of been our Achilles heel is the lack of execution, especially in critical times. And so for us, we haven't had that one game yet um, where I felt like we put all three phases together. We all played that uh, perfect game. And what a what would be a better opportunity to do that than to do it against a team like Michigan here at home. One of the reporters asked Mike if he'd ever seen a team run 32 times in a row like Michigan did against Penn State. He said every week is different and they'll have to deal with how Michigan attacks them on Saturday. You know, every game, when you game plan, you have to decide what you need to do to win the game. And obviously that's what they felt they had to do a week ago to win. Um, how they going to attack us, we need to figure that out. Um, I know that, you know, they have the ability to attack you in a number of ways. They've got a Heisman Trophy candidate at quarterback, really talented skill. Um, they've got reigning two-time Joe Moore O-line, offensive line, two straight years. So really talented. And so, you know, to have the ability to do both really well, that's kind of what we've worked toward to try to get our offense to be like. But uh, we got to be prepared for the run. we got to be able to stop the pass. Uh, we don't know how they're going to attack us, but we'll find out Saturday at noon, and we got to be prepared to make the necessary adjustments and, and do the things we can to kind of make them one-dimensional. My guest today says he has no idea what will happen in court on Friday, but he's sure the team will be locked in for the game. Up next is beat writer Austin Meek from The Athletic, so stay with us. This week on our Michigan Game Day segment, as we get ready for uh, the Maryland game Saturday, is beat writer Austin Meek from The Athletic. Welcome back to the show, Austin. Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me. Well, I know both you and I would rather be talking about just the Maryland game or football, but as we are well aware, unfortunately, the -the off-the-field stuff is not going away anytime soon. So this Friday, uh, Michigan's going to find out, we think, if Jim Harbaugh will be able to coach on Saturday. But it really is anyone's guess how that's going to go, isn't it? Yeah, I I uh, couldn't even begin to uh, to guess what will happen in that courtroom on Friday. I think it's completely unprecedented, at least from what I know. And and really, it's going to um, come down to the the opinion of of the judge, and we can all uh, you know speculate or you know go back and forth about different theories of the case here. But uh, but it's really just impossible to predict. I'm going to be there and we'll be as interested as anybody to see what comes out of that. But just, I I would, the word I would use is just completely surreal. You cover uh, college football and you get used to certain things. And this is just completely outside of anything I've, I've ever uh, covered or experienced in college football. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty surreal feeling to be in the middle of this. And I've got to think that after uh, how things have gone down in the, uh, the last week or so, Michigan is prepared for really anything and based on last week's game against Penn State, I would say uh, Michigan might not like it, but they have a, a really good feel about how Sharon and the staff handled that game, and um, they're they're going to be okay with it, aren't they? Yeah, I think uh, in a weird way, the fact that Jim Harbaugh was not able to coach the first three games of the season has prepared Michigan to deal with this circumstance now where he potentially will not co- coach the last three games of the season. Sharon Moore's had two games now this year as the acting head coach. And I think it's like anything, the more you do it, uh, the more comfortable you get in that position. So I would expect if Sharon Moore's the head coach again this week against Maryland, we would see him continue to settle into that role. There really wasn't a, a noticeable drop-off against Penn State without Jim Harbaugh there. 
And, and I would expect that to continue if, if Sharon Moore is the head coach again this week. The one thing uh, in all of this I wonder about, though, Austin, is how it's impacting the team. And I know they say they're galvanized and they're focused and they don't seem to be phased yet. But, you know, as this goes by day after day and they hear the news and try to soak it in, it, to me it seems like it would be an incredible distraction. It is to me. So, I mean, at the least they have to be uh, somewhat phased, don't you think? Well, I know the players are human and, and they hear the same things that, that we all hear. Uh, if, if any of them are on social media, they, they are, of course, are going to see what's being written and said and they they get the questions when they when they talk to the media so i, I can't imagine there's a, a person in the locker room who's been um, completely unaffected by what's going on but at the same time i do think that this team has shown a really remarkable ability to tune out the distractions to not lose focus when stuff is swirling around the program and this is not the first time they've been in this position it's, it's obviously different now this particular circumstance but there's been other things happening around the program that players have had to deal with and I think they've had they've had practice figuring out how to flip that switch and focus on football when it's time to do that Uh, and I have a pretty high degree of confidence that this team's going to be able to continue to do that because that's that's been the track record it's a, a really mature and experienced team that has has stayed focused really from day one this season and and I expect that to continue. Yeah, I do too. Well, the other thing about this entire situation that kind of amazes me is how much uh, wall-to-wall coverage this story uh, is getting around the country. You know, people that aren't even sports fans are glued to what's going on. And in a way, that's sad because it, it is now overshadowing and detracting from what this team has accomplished on the field, isn't it? Well, it, it certainly has become the dominant story. I think the dominant story in college football, much more so than anything that's happening on the field you know in a sense i i get it uh it it is an unprecedented situation it's it's something that i've never seen before Uh, and anytime you have a situation like that of course everybody's interested to to peel back the curtain a little bit and understand okay what exactly happened here what does it mean for the future i think those are all fair questions but but from the standpoint of the players it, it is i think unfortunate that this now has become the dominant story um, and, and not the fact that Michigan is 10 and 0 ranked number number three in the playoff rankings uh, has a chance to have a second straight undefeated regular season, go back to the, uh, to the college football playoff, win another big 10 championship. You know, all those are all the things that Michigan has worked for all year. And all those things are still on, on the table uh, as much as all the focus right now is, is on the off the field stuff. Uh, the season is still going on. Michigan still, has everything in front of it, all, all the goals that this team set out to accomplish, they're still there. Uh, and if Michigan in, ends up accomplishing those goals, I think that that's going to be the thing that, that people will remember from, from this season, certainly what the players will will remember uh, from this season. And I personally don't don't feel that that would be tainted in any way by all the other stuff that's come out. Um, I, I do think I, I agree with the idea that this team is talented on its own merits. You know, this, this is a team that, um, you know, on a level playing field can go out and, and beat pretty much any team in the country. And so I, I think that, I think that none of the off field stuff for me takes away from what this team has accomplished. Well, in the midst of all this drama, Michigan is preparing for uh, the trip to Maryland with uh, the Terps and noon kick. And this is an interesting team, uh, Maryland Austin. They started the season five and zero, played Ohio State really tough in the first half, and then the next four weeks, uh, the wheels fell off, didn't they? Yeah, you know this Maryland team is—it's a tough team to figure out. Uh, it's definitely been the pattern for Maryland that in in recent years they will look like a really good team in in September. Michigan played Maryland in September last year, and and Maryland. Gave them everything Michigan could handle, uh, but as you get later in the season, the pattern has been that Maryland starts to fade, and that that was the case again this year. Uh, they lost to Ohio State, ended up losing four games in a row. Uh, they did get a win against Nebraska last week uh, to get bowl eligible, so maybe that will give Maryland a little bit of momentum going into this game. 
But the pattern has been uh, if you play Maryland early in the season, you got to be ready for for a tough game. If you play Maryland late in the season, uh, a lot of times it doesn't look like the same team. So I'll be curious to see which Maryland team shows up this week. Yeah, and any conversation about Maryland has to start with uh, quarterback uh, Talia Tagovailoa. This kid can really throw the ball around the yard. When he gets hot, he's tough, isn't he? Yeah, the some of the players we talked to this week made the point uh, that you know, this is the best passing attack Michigan will see this season outside of Ohio State. And, and I think one aspect of, of Michigan's team that still is a bit untested is the fact that Michigan really hasn't faced a team that has a really prolific uh, quarterback, uh, a prolific passing attack. A lot of the quarterbacks Michigan has faced this year are either young quarterbacks, new starting quarterbacks, offenses that uh, are not necessarily going to air it out the way Maryland will. So I think this will be a really good, a really good test for Michigan going into the Ohio state game. Uh, You know, Penn state was a huge test in a lot of ways, but as we saw with that Penn state offense, that was not a dynamic offense throwing the ball down the field. And I think Maryland will be a, will be a bigger test in that regard. Uh, and will be a good preparation for what's going to come uh, in, in a couple of weeks against Ohio State. Yeah, you know, I was uh, watching Tagovailoa uh, two weeks ago against Penn State, and he was uh, he was 17 for 17 in the first half for 186 yards against that defense, eluding all of the pressure, and they were still down 21 to nothing because of turnovers. And if there's been anything consistent about this Maryland team, it's they find a way to shoot themselves in the foot almost every week, don't they? Yeah, that that has been the pattern with with Maryland, which is you know it's it, it's scary from the standpoint that I think that this is a team that has the talent to play with teams in the in the top half of the Big Ten. You know, if you have a team that uh, is is losing because they're making self inflicted mistakes, there there's always the possibility that if you catch them on the right day. If they're not making those mistakes, they can be a tough team. In the Nebraska game, it was Nebraska that made those mistakes, and uh, Maryland was able to to get a road win against a team that had been playing pretty good football. So I I don't think that you can count out this Maryland team. Uh, I think that they are one of the more talented teams in the Big Ten outside of those three at the top. And I, I do expect Maryland to throw some things at Michigan that uh, Michigan might be seeing for the first time this year. And, you know, we're this deep in the season, the two games left in the regular season. I mean, it's hard to believe uh, the season's almost over, yeah. um, but there's still some things to find out about this Michigan team. And I, I think we'll find out some of those things on Saturday. Yeah. I mean, it's clear they're going to come out and throw the ball against Michigan uh, from the get go because their running game has struggled all, all year. I mean, at the half last week against Nebraska, they were minus yardage. It's really hard to see from what we've, witnessed so far this year a one-dimensional attack like that having sustained success against that Michigan defense though isn't it well that's right I I think we really have not seen any team be able to to move the ball consistently on Michigan Penn State was probably the closest we've seen Penn State had a couple decent drives they were able to run the ball effectively at time but without that running element it it is hard to see how a team is going to sustained drives against Michigan you have to be able to be balanced against Michigan if if you get one dimensional against Michigan the the pass rush that Michigan can bring the you know the ability of Jesse Mentor uh, to really exploit a weakness that it's really tough against a a defense as good as Michigan if you're one dimensional and and we've seen that in past games you know Maryland's pass protection uh, in past matchups has, has not been able to stand up against Michigan's pressure. Uh, we'll see if they can stand up better this year, but you got to be able to run the ball if you want to take pressure off of the quarterback. And if, if Maryland can't do that, it, it could be a really long day for that Maryland offense. Yeah, and when Michigan has the ball, they're going to be up against a defense that's giving up just short of 400 yards per game. I don't know if we'll see 32 runs in a row this week, but I think Michigan's going into the game, they're going to want to run their base offense because uh, they don't want to show anything for next week. So I would think that's all we're going to see is a pretty vanilla game plan, don't you? Yeah, I'd be surprised if Michigan comes out with a lot of bells and whistles in this game. 
obviously depends a bit probably on who the head coach is in this game. I, I thought that Sharon Moore, you know, I thought he really handled things well in that game against Penn State when, you know, Michigan early in the game was in kind of a, you know, kind of a, a tricky spot where uh, they had a couple drives where Penn State got pressure on third down. It looked like J.J. McCarthy was maybe a little bit rattled. And Sharon Moore made the decision to uh, to just pound the running game, 32 straight runs to end the game, uh, and really, you know, really took control of the game and uh, made sure that Michigan was not going to lose that game because they made a mistake, right? Mm-hmm. Michigan was not going to, you know, put the ball at risk and, and risk you know, a pick six, a turnover. It was one of those plays that Penn State would have needed to have a chance to win the game because Penn State wasn't going to win that game if the only way they could score was to drive the ball down the field against Michigan's defense. So I thought it was a really smart game plan for Sharon Moore in, in that game. I would expect against Maryland to see more like the Michigan offense we've seen the rest of the season, which is a more balanced offense. Uh, I, I would expect J.J. McCarthy to throw it more than eight times in this game. But I also think that if Michigan can run the ball uh, the way they did against Penn State, they'll, they'll be happy to do that uh, and get out of uh, Maryland with a win and then give, give Ohio State their best shot uh, in a couple weeks. Whatever the game plan is, uh, we'll find out Saturday. I, I think one thing they cannot mess around with this team. It's really an important. It is important every time you get on the road to try to get ahead early and not give these guys hope. Yeah, and that's something that Michigan has has done so well. Is uh, if you look at really, you know, every every game Michigan has played this year, Michigan has had control of the game in the second half. You know, there really has not been a game where the other team. Uh, could feel like they really had any kind of control over the game. And so I'm sure Michigan's going to go out there and try to do the same thing in this game. You don't want uh, on the road to be in a position where the team trying to pull the upset, you know, makes a couple plays. Now all of a sudden you're in the fourth quarter in a tight game and, uh, you know, that pressure starts to build. Michigan has, has been the team really every game that has been putting that pressure on the other team. Uh, and if they can do that again, then they'll be 11-0 and 0 and um, have a chance to accomplish everything they want to accomplish going into that last game of the season. I know we're playing Maryland this week, but uh, a lot of folks are already starting to focus ahead to next weekend in the big house. What are your week in advance thoughts on how Michigan and Ohio State match up against each other right now, Austin? Well, I think, I think it is going to be, at least on paper, one of – one of the most intense Michigan Ohio State games ever played, which is really saying something given the history of the rivalry and how intense that game is every year. But there's just so much packed into this game, uh, you don't even really know where to start. Um, uh, yeah. If there, if it was just the two teams, uh, it would be maybe the game of the year in college football. But it's the two teams and then a, a whole lot else uh, on top of that, given everything that's transpired. So. I, I think that really for both teams, it's going to be a matter of once the game kicks off, being able to make it about what's happening on the field and not about all of the other stuff that's going to get brought into it. And I think if it's just about what happens on the field, I feel like Michigan is a slightly better team. I'd give Michigan a slight edge. I think Michigan has the better quarterback, the more experienced quarterback. You know, Ohio State has – I think a much improved defense from last year and has a couple playmakers who are really special, starting with Marvin Harrison Jr., the best wide receiver in college football. But I think it's a very evenly matched game. Uh, I, I think that, you know, the two teams, you know, the strengths and the weaknesses of the two teams kind of you know, match up in interesting ways. And I, I expect it to be just a war uh, for four quarters. Uh, I think based on what I've seen the last two seasons, and based on what I saw for Michigan on Saturday in the first uh, the first matchup they've had with a, a really talented team, I didn't see anything that changed my opinion that Michigan is the best team in the Big Ten. I felt that way from, from day one of the season, and I still feel that way right now. Final question before we let you get away then, Austin. I thought two years ago the uh, atmosphere in the Big House was like nothing I had ever experienced in the decades that I've been going to games. It was incredible. And I've got to think Saturday, next Saturday, is going to be 
even better because of everything that's going on. This crowd is going to be just out of their minds, aren't they? Yeah, I, I can't even I can't even imagine what it's going to be like one way or another. You know, if, if Jim Harbaugh is able <laughs> to run out of the tunnel with the team, uh, the sound you're going to hear in that stadium is going to be you know, something that I, I don't know if I've ever heard before or, or can even imagine right now. I mean, that's just going to be crazy. If Jim Harbaugh can't run out of the tunnel with that team, the emotion of that for the crowd, I'm sure, is, is going to be uh, going to be palpable. So either way, no matter what happens, the atmosphere in that game is going to be, you know, it's going to be an 11 on a scale of one to 10. <laughs> and um, I, you know, I can't I, I can't wait for it. Personally, I mean, it's going to be a it's going to be wild to be there. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. But uh, first things first, take care of Maryland on Saturday, and uh, then get to next week. Here with us today, as we've uh, been talking about a lot of uh, stuff uh, and the Maryland game, has been beat writer. Austin Meek from The Athletic. Austin, always great to have you on the show. You're very gracious with your time. So thank you, and we look forward to another visit soon. All right. Thanks for having me, Mike. On quick hits today, injury-wise, we are in good shape for Saturday, as has been the case all season. The official report will be released on Saturday morning. Here are a few game day notes of interest. Michigan leads the series with 10 wins against one loss. The first meeting was in Ann Arbor on September 28th of 1985, a 20-10 Michigan win. Last year's game took place in Ann Arbor on September 24th, It was a much tighter game than expected. In the end, it was a 34-27 win. Head coach Mike Loxley is in his fifth year. His record is 26-27. Last year, Maryland finished 8-5 overall, 4-5 in conference play, good for fourth in the Big Ten East. They ended the season in the Duke's Mayo Bowl, beating North Carolina State 16-12. The weatherman says it will be partly sunny in College Park, With temps reaching the low 50s, not much chance of rain, but maybe a little windy, gusts up to 15 miles per hour are expected during the game. As I mentioned earlier, this might not be a trap game, but with all of the outside noise and the very real chance Jim will not be there, it will be another challenging day for the team. The Terps have the weapons on offense to challenge us, especially in the passing game. So, as always, It will be about getting out of the gate fast and not letting up. Hopefully the team isn't as nervous as I will be on Saturday. So let's take care of business, boys, and head back to Ann Arbor. Next week, you know what's coming. We all do. The game. To say the hype next week will be intense is an understatement. It will be like nothing we've seen in the history of this rivalry. For Tuesday's Visitors Edition, we're hoping to have Ohio State play-by-play voice Paul Keels join us. If we can't get him, I'm sure we will find another Buckeye Media person to join us. On Thursday's Michigan Game Day show, we will be joined by the angel of the big house, beat writer Angelique Shingelis from the Detroit News. I've been doing the show for 14 years now, believe it or not, and Angelique has previewed the game with me 12 of those 13 years. We missed the COVID year when the game wasn't played, which Ohio State never seems to forget. At any rate, we will be ready next week, and more importantly, so will the team, for another date with destiny and everything on the line. And man, I cannot wait already. That will do it for now, though. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Have a great Wolverine weekend, everyone. Think victory, beat Maryland. Until we meet again... Take care, and as always, go blue.
Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24 7 for your calls at 313 263 4842. That's 313 263 4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!